Hi, on this episode of Extremely Frank, I invite a guest over to share their experience of treating a patient that's actually having a stroke. But before we begin this episode, I think it's extremely important to talk about what is a stroke, how to recognize some of the signs and symptoms of a stroke, and what you can do if you see someone having a stroke. So a stroke, also called a CVA, which stands for cerebrovascular accident, is a situation in which there's a reduction or interruption of blood flow to a certain part of the brain, thereby preventing oxygen and nutrients to that area. And when that happens, the brain cells in that area get damaged and they can die. Now there are two types of strokes. There's something called the ischemic stroke and something called the hemorrhagic stroke. Now between the two types of strokes, the ischemic stroke is by and far and away the most common type of stroke, accounting for more than 80% of the strokes that happen in the United States. Now an ischemic stroke is basically when there's a blockage in the blood vessel, thereby preventing oxygen and nutrients get into a certain part of the brain causing damage. A hemorrhagic stroke is when there is a blood vessel that bursts causing bleeding inside the brain and also preventing oxygen and nutrients getting past the damaged part of the blood vessel and also causing increased pressure inside the brain as well. Now the reason why this topic is so important is because every three and a half minutes someone suffers a stroke in the United States and on average 405 people die every day from a stroke. It is also the leading cause of long-term disability in the United States. But there are things we can do to help minimize the effects of a stroke. Now there is a relatively easy acronym to help recognize the signs and symptoms of a stroke and it is called BE-FAST. The B stands for balance. So look for problems with balance or uh, steadiness on someone's feet. Now this is not someone who's actually having a stroke, but it is a good example of someone who's lost their balance and has become somewhat disoriented due to an injury in the brain, which is the same type of symptoms you see with someone having a stroke. E stands for eyes. If someone complains of blurred vision or loss of vision in one or both eyes, that could be an early sign of a stroke. F stands for face. Look for any facial drooping or ask if there's numbness to one side of the face. And an easy way to check is to ask someone to smile or smile yourself. And if you see that there's an asymmetric or a crooked smile when there wasn't one there before, that could be a concern. A stands for arms. Look for weakness or numbness in the arms or legs. And you can check this by raising an arm or a leg to see if it's weaker than the other side or asking if one side feels numb. The S stands for speech. Listen to see if there's a slurring of the speech or if someone's having problems getting the words out. In this example, former Congressman Ron Paul suffers a stroke during a live stream video. If it has to be liquidated, we have to get rid of that. That's a burden. We have very worried. We can't find it. You can see that during this interview, Ron Paul starts slurring his speech, and there's a noticeable left facial droop, and he's having a hard time finding the right words to say. And these are all signs and symptoms you should be aware of that could be an indication of a stroke. And T stands for time. Make sure you get to the appropriate medical facility as soon as possible by calling 911. Because the sooner you get to that facility, the most likely you have a better outcome. As I mentioned before, optimal outcomes are always best when you get to the treatment facility as soon as possible. And if you do know when a stroke or the symptoms started, it is good to record that time because it will determine treatment options. In addition to that, if you could form a plan before any emergencies happen, whether, regardless of what type of emergency it is. So for example, especially in a big city, try to find out where the best place is to be seen if you're having a stroke or a heart attack or some sort of trauma issue because many times minutes count. And I wanna say that if you could try to keep a typewritten a note on your persons, listing out your medical conditions your medical uh, medication list and the dosages and any allergies you may have. Now many facilities have these electronic systems where they can extract the information but sometimes you're traveling and then sometimes those systems are down as well. One last thing I want to talk about is mini stroke or TIA which stands for transient ischemic attack. It is basically a, an ischemic stroke in which the symptoms only last 24 hours or less. But it is imperative that if you have a mini stroke that you go see a doctor as soon as possible because it usually is a predictor of an impending stroke. So once again, that acronym is B FAST, B for balance, E for eyes, F for face, A for arms, 
S for speech, and T for time. So on this episode of Extremely Frank, I've invited a good friend of mine named Dr. Ben Koenig, who's an emergency medicine physician who has an incredible breadth of knowledge on so many different things and also happens to be a car enthusiast as well as you'll see. So having said that, let's get started. Okay, so today on today's episode of Extremely Frank, we have a good friend of mine named Dr. Ben Koenig, who's been a lifelong friend of mine since college and through medical school, and he's an emergency medicine physician that uh, works locally with uh, in the area with me. So uh, welcome, Ben. Thanks for, coming, uh, thanks for coming by. Oh, well, thank you, Frank, for having me on the show. Appreciate it. <laughs> <laughs> so, Ben, I brought you on because I, I know you've got, you're a great storyteller. I know you've got some uh, interesting stories that, you've, you know, that we've all gone through in our lives, and I want to see if you had anything that you'd like to share with us today. Sure, sure. Yeah, I mean, so, um, yeah, when I think about it, when I think about interesting cases I've seen, I, for some reason, I always remember, like, recent ones. <laughs> I guess that's probably true of everybody that uh, you re- you remember the more recent ones. So um, I just had a, a case, like, within the last week or two that, like, just stands out in my mind. And I thought I'd kind of share it with um, uh, your audience because... Uh, there's some things they might learn from it. And I actually have like a, a few things I'd like to kind of give you as advice from an emergency physician that maybe you haven't heard uh, elsewhere. So I guess hot take. Sounds <laughs> great. I mean, why don't, go ahead, share the story with us. All right. Let's hear it. All right. So um, why don't I actually teach you a little bit about circulation to the brain? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> sure. <laughs> I'm prepared for this. I actually drew this picture already. This is a beautiful looking brain. Okay, so in very simple terms. That is pretty good. This is your brain. That's your eye for orientation. And this is your brain. And this is the thinking portion of your brain up here. And this is your brain stem. This is the part that keeps you alive. It sends signals for you to breathe, to keep you awake, and to keep uh, keep you breathing, keep your heart beating. So to me, I kind of like think about things that are underappreciated, like my car. It's an underappreciated car, which is good for me. But um, there's an artery right here. This is my favorite artery. This is the basal artery. It's like an underappreciated artery because it's the artery that supplies the blood to this most important part of the brain. I think you've asked most people, what's your favorite artery? They're not gonna say basal. I say basilar. <laughs> so now I actually work at a stroke center. So actually we deal a lot with the circulation of the brain. I think about it every day of my life, basically. So um, maybe, I, you know, that that's just my personal bias, I guess. So inter- when I think about like evolution, it's almost like certain things in evolution, like cause something to be designed well. So if I say it's designed well, I mean it evolved well. Uh, to 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 be like that. So if you have an important artery like this, you need a really good blood supply to it. And this has a pretty good blood supply. There's one artery that comes down and splits and goes through your vertebral column. That's your vertebral artery. And I, I think it's nice because there's actually two arteries that go into one to supply this. So if one were getting blocked off, like and you can actually block off a vertebral artery by turning your head really far to the side, there's still a backup. But the brain blood supply is all about redundancy. And one of the most uh, notable features of the blood supply of the brain is that there's a big circle of blood vessels right here. That's called the circle of Willis. And it's almost like an engineer designed this for redundancy. Because the circle of Willis gets blood supply from these vertebral arteries through the basilar artery back here. But then it's also got the big boys, the carotids, come right into it on either side. These are the carotids, and actually the carotids come off of the aorta, which the aorta sits right here, like that. So you got a direct line from the aorta right up to here through your carotids. So what's beautiful about this is that it's a circle. So if you block off one carotid, well, the left side can compensate for the right side, and the right can compensate for the left. And you have the basilar artery also. So you basically have four arteries you can knock off a few of them, but you're still getting blood supply to here. And then there's basically three pairs of arteries that go up to the thinking part of the brain, posterior, middle, and anterior cerebral arteries. So in a nutshell, that is the circulation to the brain. 
So let's just take a moment of pause here and discuss in a little bit of simplified terms of what Ben just discussed without going into a big anatomy lesson even. Now blood that contains oxygen and nutrients comes off a big vessel coming off the heart called the aorta. And off the aorta or this big vessel are smaller vessels that branch off. And two branches that come off of the aorta that come towards the front of your neck are called the common carotid arteries. In fact, we can typically check for your pulse in the front of your neck by checking your carotid arteries. And then a pair of vessels that comes off the aorta goes towards the back of the neck. And these are called the vertebral arteries. Now the arteries in the back of the neck, called the vertebral arteries, come together and join to one major vessel called the basilar artery, which is Ben's favorite artery as he mentioned before, which then connects to the circle of Willis. The arteries in the front of the neck, the carotid arteries, come and join the circle of Willis as well. Now the circle of Willis is nothing more than just a major hub. It's like a railroad hub where vessels come off that hub and provide blood to the rest of the brain. Now the way the circle of Willis is designed is that there's some level of redundancy. So if you knock out one or possibly two of the major vessels, there's enough redundancy to provide oxygen and nutrients to the brain until something can be done. That's a pretty good drawing, and it's a pretty good explanation of the uh, circulatory system and the very fact that there's a lot of redundancy. But despite the very fact we have redundancy, we still have obviously insults that can occur with the brain that we call, you know, they can cause obviously some some strokes. Right. Right. Absolutely. And you know, people should know, like, um, when we talk about strokes. Um, we see strokes every day in the emergency department, so we kind of know what they look like, but there's like patterns that we see. Posterior strokes, problems with this artery, they cause problems with balance and problems with vision. Middle cerebral is the most common. We see this all the time. This is a classic stroke where people lose strength on one side of their face, their arm, their leg. They start talking either slurred or using wrong words. And then the anterior often actually also affects the motor part of the brain and there could be those same kinds of symptoms but if you ever get those symptoms you should have a plan to go to the hospital immediately because we might be able to help if you get there soon enough but time is of the essence with a stroke so you know those symptoms get to the hospital and also I always think you should think about what hospital am I going to go to in the event that I have this ahead of time so you are going to be prepared for where to go so um about a week ago, uh, I was called into the room by a, by the nurse, and uh, she said, "You know, Dr. Ben, Dr. Ben, you gotta come in here right away. You gotta see this guy." Well, the chief complaint was, he's like, "My my my head, it feels throbby. It feels, and and the color is changing. It's it, it might even be turning bluish." Well, I've seen patients in the past like uh, turning blue, and it turns out to be something silly. Like, "Oh, is that a new blue shirt?" Yeah. Well, guess what? The dye on that shirt is leaking through, causing the blue color on your skin. <laughs> I'm sorry you paid a copay to hear that because <laughs> that's ridiculous. But um, blue could mean many things. So I go into the room and I look at the guy and I'm like, oh, yeah, his head is kind of what, what we call mottled. It's like you can tell it's not like, uh, you know, perfusing well. Um, it's, it's kind of deeper reddish kind of hue and then to look at his lips I see some cyanosis and I see some cyanosis in the ears and so as an emergency physician boom the wheels start turning um, first thing I think well his whole body maybe is being under perfused maybe his blood pressure is really low um, so I check a few things I'm like hmm I push on his cheek and I do something called capillary refill. Capillary refill is where you blanch a certain part of the body and see how long it takes to return back to normal color, which should be less than two seconds. How long is it taking the blood to circulate back to there? And I push and I make one, two, three, four. Um, whoa, it's low. But from the neck down, everything's fine. I push on his fingernail like this, one, two. Like the circulation's fine from the neck down. So I'm like something is affecting only the circulation to the head. That's a problem. So, um, you know, kind of going back to this, the, the circulation to the face actually comes off the external cries, which branch off of here. So this is telling me something is blocking off circulation to both sides of his face, here and here at the bottom of the carotid arteries. I gotta ask him a few more questions. So, sir, do you have any medical problems? Uh, he's like, oh, I have an artificial heart valve in my aorta that's been replaced. I'm like, oh, okay. Uh, take a blood there yeah I take a blood there um, so 
I'm thinking, oh, could he have like had like a, a stenotic one side carotid anyway and like blocked off the other? Or, you know, I guess that's the first thing I think. He's like, he's like, I also have something they call uh, an aortic aneurysm. I'm like, oh, you do? <laughs> he's like, yeah, I got to get a CAT scan every year to see how big it is. So with an aortic aneurysm, basically an aortic aneurysm is like a ballooning of that big, big blood vessel they call the aorta. And I brought a prop. <laughs> It's like it starts to blow up, but with balloons, like you get to a certain size when you're uh, blowing up a balloon where it gets much easier to blow up. So with an aortic aneurysm, once it gets to about, so you watch it if it's like three and a half, that's a small one, four, that's a small one. If your aortic aneurysm gets to six centimeters, that's when it needs to be repaired because otherwise if it starts exceeding that, it's going to start ballooning and if it ruptures, it's kind of game over. Um, it's like you would you would die from that if it ruptures. So why actually once you get that your device out here again, and so just pump it up again to explain the aneurysm. And so if we, so it's like a ballooning happens, a weakness in the wall of the aorta. Uh oh, <laughs> that's it. <laughs> they died. So oh, sorry. Basically, the aorta is basically a, a vessel, a blood vessel, a tube. Yes. And then the tube is you know if it's a long skinny tube, it's fine. But if you have it start to get thinned out and it expands to a certain, when you expand that balloon like you just did, it, it further expands, the walls get thinner and thinner and that's a weakness. Yeah. And that's what an aneurysm, yeah. an aneurysm really is. Yeah. And it, it almost get you know, the bigger it gets, the easier it gets to get weaker and weaker and weaker. And then once the aneurysm does get to a certain size, like past six centimeters, and if it does burst, you can see what happens, all the blood, and then obviously yeah. you die from it, so. So our patient, I surmise he must have been less than six centimeters if they hadn't fixed it yet, at least at last time they checked, but we don't know where it is today. But uh, this is a big clue for me, though, too, because another thing that can happen is if you have an aneurysm, yeah, you can rupture an aneurysm, but the other thing that you can happen that can happen is you can get a what's called a dissection, where uh, there's like a weakness in the wall, and blood kind of splits the wall of the aorta and makes like a flap and can cut circulation off to things that branch off of that aorta. Okay. So we know he's got that. It's kind of obvious now to me as the physician, like, okay, we've got a real problem. This guy, prob we know he has that aneurysm. He now probably has a dissection. Um, and it's probably, based on what I'm seeing, cutting off circulation to both of those carotid blood vessels, here and here. And the aneurysm's probably here. Um, the only reason I'm probably able to talk to him is because there's a redundancy here in these vertebral vessels, which normally supply 20% of blood to the brain, are putting some blood into circle, circle of Willis, and I can still talk to him, and he's still awake. Um, so this, you got to act fast because this guy doesn't have much time. This is right. a, one of the most time-sensitive conditions we see like in medical emergencies. Um, like that. So it's, I got to give them the cat scan. We're going now. We're going to tell them what they're going to do when they get there. I'm going to stay there till I see the picture. And sure enough, it's exactly what I think it is. His aneurysm had grown to eight and a half. Oh my God. So it was huge. And there was a huge dissection going right up to those carotids. Uh, it, it stopped there. I did the carotid blood vessels too, since we're there and it would only take five seconds longer. Um, but now my job is to get him to a surgeon as fast as I can to can fix this. And how, how did the guy end up doing, by the way? He lived. That's great. Uh, yeah, I, it was a heroic surgery. It probably, I think it took like somewhere between eight and 10 hours. Uh, and um, yeah, he lived. I mean, I think, the, I think the incredible part about your story here is that um, because of your knowledge and because of the physician's knowledge of you know the anatomy, you didn't even need a CAT scan. You could already somewhat pinpoint where the insult was going to be in the circulatory system based on the physical exam and the history. I mean, um, and the very fact that you knew, like, obviously both carotids were blocked off. It had to be closer to the, the root of the aorta versus it's not going to be higher up because obviously both carotids were, yeah. were being affected. Because yeah, we always try to say, you know, you always need, like, one thing to explain all the symptoms. Rarely is it two different things occurring simultaneously. Uh, anything else? Any other stories you want well, to share know, here? I mean, I would like to kind of so point point out that you know uh, one thing that I think about is an emergency physician that maybe like non physicians could also take a lesson from is that I think about all the different things that that could happen to me and where I would go if that happened. <laughs> you know, so like I think like 
getting to the right hospital uh, in a timely fashion is a good idea. So I will tell you that I have a plan, right? If I have a stroke, I'm going to one place. If I have a heart attack, I'm going to a particular place. If I had an aortic dissection, if I had symptoms of that, there's a hospital I have in mind to go to. Uh, if I have major trauma, I have a hospital in mind to go to. And I think like actually everybody would benefit from that, you know, to like, it's kind of like being prepared. <laughs> I <laughs> like, agree. I, you know, I have, it, have it in mind, say, this is where I'm going to go if X, Y, Z, and I've already thought it through like that. And I don't know if like people have disseminated that piece of advice very wide, widely, but I think that would be good for everybody to kind of think through. Like, and ask around, maybe make friends with your local emergency physician, and they'll tell you there where the good places to go are. <laughs> or even talk to your primary care doctor. Yeah, you well, know, the primary care doctor. That they, they, they should know. Um, I think, well, I think, first of all, it's, it's, a, great, it's a great idea. It's a great, it's a great uh, something everyone should plan for. We plan for, mm -hmm. we, most of us plan for lots of things in our lives. We yeah. should, this is obviously something very, very important. Yeah. I think we're fortunate in our city that we have a children's hospital. We have a trauma center. We have... Uh, places where there's, uh, you know, stroke, uh, where stroke strokes, care. stroke care, care exactly. Care. Yeah, it's, um, uh, we are, we have just the right size city that we've, we, you can check all the boxes. Exactly. We've got stuff that, we've got people that can do all of these things. Uh, but if you're in a smaller city, you may not have those uh, luxuries. But if you are in an area where you have those, uh, you know, those different services, I do think it makes sense because, like you said, I mean, uh, time is of the essence. Mm -hmm. Whether it's with a heart attack or whether it's a stroke, um. You can go to any hospital, but ultimately they'll, they'll transfer you to the the appropriate facility, and that's just time yeah, that's spent. Time, time lost. Right. Yeah. So I think that's a great. I think that's uh, that's actually great advice. Mm -hmm. And um, you're right. If if you don't, if you currently live in a city and you don't know where that uh, those resources are, I mean, talk to if you you can always call your primary care physician, or like you said, if you if you can make friends with an ER doctor or someone else. <laughs> that would be that would be the best. I'll be um, your friend. <laughs> that's right. Or, or you can certainly contact us. We can certainly help find those locations for whatever city you're in. I mean, mm -hmm. it should not be that, uh, shouldn't be that difficult. Um, I want to thank my guest, Dr. Ben Koenig, for coming in and sharing that story with us today, as well as some great tips regarding stroke. If you did enjoy this video, please like, comment, and subscribe, and don't forget to hit that notifications button. I'll see you on the next episode. Look at that. Actually, in the uh, James Bond movie, Goldeneye, when Z introduced the car, he had two very large missiles right behind the, uh, <laughs> right behind the headlights. I, I don't know how he would have picked those. The guy well, yeah, I was going to say. <laughs> came for the battery, for crying out loud. You got missiles in here. You got two missiles in there. Amazing. Very cool.